the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. The disposition of Elizabeth was originally deficient in benevolence and sympathy, and prone to suspicion, pride, and anger. And we observe with pain in the progress of her history how much influences to which her high station and the peculiar circumstances of her reign inevitably exposed her, tended in various modes to exasperate these radical evils of her nature. The extravagant flattery administered to her daily and hourly was of most pernicious effect. It not only fostered in her an absurd excess of personal vanity, but, what was worse, by filling her with exaggerated notions, both of her own wisdom and of her sovereign power and prerogative. It contributed to render her rule more stern and despotic, and her mind of many points incapable of sober counsel. This effect was remarked by one of her clergy, who in a sermon preached in her presence, had the boldness to tell her that she who had been meek as lamb was become an untamable heifer, for which reproof he was in his turn reprehended by her majesty on his quitting the pulpit, as, quote, an overconfident man who dishonored his sovereign. The decay of her beauty was an unwelcome truth, which all the artifices of adulation were unable to hide from her secret consciousness since she could never behold her image in a mirror during the latter years of her life without transports of impotent anger. And this circumstance contributed not a little to sour her temper, while it rendered the young and lovely the chosen objects of her malignity. On this head, the following striking anecdote is furnished by Sir John Harrington. She did off ask the ladies around her chamber if they loved to think of marriage, and the wise ones did conceal well their liking here too, as knowing the queen's judgment in this matter. Sir Matthew Arundel's fair cousin, not knowing so deeply as her fellows, was asked one day hereof, and simply said she had thought much about marriage, if her father did consent to the man she loved. You seem honest in faith, said the queen. I will sue for you to your father." The damsel was not displeased hereat, and when Sir Robert came to court, the queen asked him hereon, and pressed his consenting if the match was discreet. Sir Robert, much astonished at this news, said he never heard his daughter had liking to any man, and wanted to gain knowledge of her affection, but would give free consent to what was most pleasing to her highness's will and advice. Then I will do the rest, saith the queen. The lady was called in, and the queen told her that her father had given his free consent. Then, replied the lady, I shall be happy and please your grace. So thou shalt, but not to be a fool and marry. I have his consent given to me, and I vow thou shalt never get it into thy possession. So go to thy business. I see thou art a bold one to own thy foolishness so readily." The perils of many kinds from open and secret enemies, by which Elizabeth had found herself environed since her unwise and unauthorized attention of the Queen of Scots, aggravated the mistrustfulness of her nature, and the severities which fear and anger led her to exercise against that portion of her subjects, who still adhered to the ancient faith, increased its harshness. Plans of insurrection and even of assassination were frequently revolved in their councils, but as often disappointed by the extraordinary vigilance and sagacity of her ministers, while the courage evinced by herself under these circumstances of severe probation was truly admirable. Francis Bacon relates that the council once represented to her the danger in which she stood by the continual conspiracies against her life, and acquainted her that a man was lately taken who stood ready in a very dangerous and suspicious manner to do the deed, and they showed her the weapon, wherewith he thought to have acted it. And therefore they advised her that she should go less abroad to take air weekly attended as she used to. But the queen answered that she would rather be dead than put in custody. 
Elizabeth, when angry, observed little moderation in the expression of her feelings. In the private letters, even of Cecil, whom she treated on the whole with more consideration than any other person, we find not infrequent mention of the harsh words which he had to endure from her, sometimes, as he says, on occasions when he appeared to himself deserving rather of thanks than of censure. We'll continue the story after a quick word from our sponsor. The Earl of Shrewsbury often complains to his correspondents of her captious and irascible temper, and we find Walsingham taking pains to console Sir Henry Sidney under some manifestations of her displeasure by the assurance that they had proceeded only from one of those transient gusts of passion for which she was accustomed to make sudden amends to her faithful servants by new and extraordinary tokens of her favor. Meanwhile, the Earl of Leicester, whose haughty and graspy spirit led him to covet distinction and authority in every line, was eagerly soliciting the supreme command of his important armament. And in spite of the general mediocrity of his talents and his very slight experience in the art of war, his partial mistress had the weakness to indulge him in this unreasonable and ill-advised pretension. The title of General of the Queen's Auxiliaries in Holland was conferred upon him, and with it a command over the whole English navy, paramount to that of the Lord High Admiral himself. He landed at Flushing and was received first by its governor, and afterwards by the states of Holland and Zealand with the highest honors, and with the most magnificent festivities which it was in their power to exhibit. A splendid band of youthful nobility followed in his train. The foremost of them all was his stepson, Robert, Earl of Essex, now in his nineteenth year, who had already made his appearance at court and experienced from Her Majesty a reception which clearly prognosticated to such as were conversant in the ways of court the height of favor to which he was predestined. It was highly characteristic of the jealous haughtiness of Elizabeth's temper that the extraordinary honors lavished by the states upon Leicester instantly awakened her utmost indignation. She regarded them as too high for any subject, even for him who enjoyed the first place in her royal favor, whom she had invested with an amplitude of authority quite unexplained, and who represented herself in the council of the States General. She expressed her anger in a tone which both Leicester and the Belgians trembled, and the explanations and humble submissions of both parties were found scarcely sufficient to appease her. At the same time, the incapacity of misconduct of Leicester as a commander were daily becoming conspicuous and offensive in the eyes of the Dutch authorities, and the most serious evils would immediately have ensued, but for the prudence, the magnanimity, the conciliating behavior, and the strenuous exertions by which his admirable nephew labored unceasingly to remedy his vices and cover his deficiencies. Even though the results were not what she had hoped for, Elizabeth received her favorite with her usual complacency, either because his abject submissions had in reality succeeded in banishing from her mind all resentment of his conduct in Holland, or because she required the support of his long-tried counsels under the awful responsibilities of that impending conflict with the whole collected force of the Spanish monarchy for which she felt herself summoned to prepare. If we turn our attentions to the Queen of Scots, soon after the arrival of Mariette Fotheringay, Elizabeth, according to the provisions of the late Act, issued out a commission to forty noblemen and privy councillors, empowering them to try and pass sentence upon Mary, daughter and heir of King James V and late Queen of Scots. For it was thus that she was designated, with a view of intimating to her that she was no longer to be regarded as possessing the rights of a sovereign princess. Thirty-six of the commissioners repaired immediately to Fotheringay, where they arrived on the 9th of October, 1586 incited Mary to appear before them. This summons she refused to obey on the double ground that as an absolute princess she was free from all human jurisdiction, since kings only could be her peers, and that having been detained in England as a prisoner, 
she had not enjoyed the protection of the laws and consequently ought not in equity to be regarded as amenable to their sentence. Weighty as these objections may appear, the commissioners refused to admit them and declared that they would proceed to judge her by default. This menace she had first disregarded. But soon after, overcome by the artful representations of Hatton and the interferences which must inevitably be drawn from her refusal to justify herself for the satisfaction of a princess who had declared that she desired nothing so much as the establishment of her innocence, she changed her mind and consented to plead. None of her papers were restored, no counsel was assigned to her, and her request that her two secretaries, whose evidence was principally relied on by the prosecutors, might be confronted with her, was denied. But all these were hardships, customarily inflicted on prisoners accused of high treason. And it does not appear that, with the respect to its forms and modes of proceedings, Mary had cause to complain that her trial was other than a regular and legal one. On the first appearance, she renewed her protestation against the competence of the tribunal. Brumley, Lord Chancellor, answered her, showing the jurisdiction of the English law over all persons within the country, and the commissioners ordered both the objection and the reply to be registered, as if to save the point of law, but it does not appear that it was ever referred for decision to any other authority. Intercepted letters, authenticated by the testimony of her secretaries, form the chief evidence against Mary. From these, the Crown lawyers showed, and she did not attempt to deny, that she had suffered her correspondence to address her as Queen of England, that she had endeavored, by means of English fugitives, to incite the Spaniards to invade the country, and that she had been negotiating, at Rome, the terms of a transfer of all of her claims, present and future, to the King of Spain, disinheriting, by his unnatural act, her own schismatic son. The further charge of having concurred in the late plot for the assassination of Elizabeth, she strongly denied, and attempted to disprove. But it stood on equally good evidence with all the rest. And in spite of some suggestions of which her modern partisans have endeavored to give her the benefit, there appears no solid foundation on which an impartial inquirer can rest any doubt of the fact. The deportment of Mary on this trying emergency exhibited somewhat of the dignity, but more of the spirit and adroitness for which she had been famed. She justified her negotiations or intrigues with foreign princes on the ground of her inalienable right to employ all the means within her power for the recovery of that liberty of which she had been cruelly and unjustly deprived. With great effrontery, she persisted in denying that she had ever entertained with Babington any correspondence whatsoever, and she urged that his pretendings to receive, or having in fact received, letters written in her cipher was no conclusive proof against her, since it was the same which she used in her French correspondence and might have fallen into other hands. But finding herself hard-pressed by evidence on this part of the subject, she afterwards hazarded a rash attempt to fix on Walsingham the imputation of having suborned witnesses and forged letters for her destruction. The aged minister, greatly moved by this attack upon his character, immediately rose and asserted his innocence in a manner so solemn and with such circumstantial corroboration as compelled her to retract the accusation with an apology. The commissioners, after a full hearing of the cause, quitted Fotheringay, and meeting again in the Star Chamber, summoned before them the two secretaries who voluntarily confirmed on oath the whole of their former depositions. After this, they proceeded to a unanimous sentence of death against Mary, which was immediately transmitted to the Queen for her approbation. On the same day, a declaration was published on the part of the commissioners and judges, importing that the sentence did, in no manner, derogate from the titles and honors of the King of Scots. And that concludes part six of the memoirs of the court of Queen Elizabeth. I'm Rebecca Larson, 
Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.